because with all these injuries, you're getting a call. I mean, it feels, Kratz, like we're going to have very aggressive 60-man roster for most teams this season. Is it because is it because it's big names that are going down that it's really like in the forefront? Like it just feels like every every time you turn on your feed, you get an update. Ah, this guy elbow evaluation, you know, t- tired elbow or sore elbow, and then leads to the inevitable. I think the big names help, right? Big names have been a, a big deal, obviously. Um, Big names have been a big deal, uh, but it, plus it's just one after the other, right? You know, yesterday we had Strider, Fromber, right? Shane Bieber. We'll they, get to Pavetta later. Yeah, Pavetta. We've already had Garrett Cole go down. You know, I mean, it's just like boom, 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 boom. It's, it's one of the reasons why we're having Keith Meister on. Mm-hmm. The, the, the main doctor, um, you know, one of the main doctors that does these surgeries, and we're going to talk to him, especially after with Verlander's comments and – some of the other guys have come on and said certain things. It's been it's been crazy. Yeah, Garrett Cole comments. I was just listening to Shane Bieber's comments before we got to the show here. So positive vibes first, at least for Padres fans. Let's charge the damn mound. There were some great games last night. The Fernando Tatis Jr. got brushed back. Maybe he was going to charge the mound. Instead, just charge the baseball and the next pitch. Sprinted around the bases. And the Padres came back from 8 nothing. I know it was hard for AJ to watch, but the Cubs were up 8 nothing over the Padres. <laughs> <laughs> and the Padres win 9-8. That was a rocking game, though. I mean, that is, that is San Diego baseball at its finest. That place is awesome to watch a game. I know you've been there a bunch in the last few years. It's awesome when you have nights like this. You're down 8 nothing. Like, that game's over. Most people are putting in uh, their backups and – Crone zone hit a homer, and then Tatis obviously hit the homer to to give him the lead. But it was the atmosphere got rocking. This is what we talked about though with the Cubs. If you remember before the season, like their bullpen was a big question mark. Mm-hmm. I know they brought in Hector Neris, and there were some other things. But you're up eight nothing in the big leagues. That's got to be game over. Mm-hmm. The Crone zone. They let the Crone zone hit it, and it really like. The thing for me about the Padres, like, isn't this what the Padres are supposed to do last year all year, and now they're supposed to do it again this year? I know they have all these athletic, like, shortstops, and that's a story all the time. But these guys, the top five in this lineup can hit. And when Tatis hit that home run to put them up, oh, man, that place. I've never been there for when, you know, it's been sold out like this. 19 was when Tatis made his debut. I was there for that game, and it was sold out. but. The energy that in the stadium, like you could just see the cameras rocking for a for an April April eighth game. It's it's got to be awesome. Cronenworth's bringing it too. I know it's early, although he's played a little more than most because he had the Korea series. He's three eighty two on base, five hundred slug, eight eighty two OPS, one forty six OPS plus. Sitting three thirteen, he's a half a win player already, and we're what a week and change in for him. He's bringing it after a really down 2023. I mean, he was a below average hitter last year after being an above average hitter through the first three seasons of his career and a two time all star. He's having a great year. He's off to a great start. Great start. He Is this not him, the though? Reason they lost. He don't like, don't like, oh, Cronenworth got no. traded and all this stuff. Everybody's sitting there <laughs> going, like, oh, I've got to get rid of Cronenworth. It's like, whoa. Like, he was not the reason they lost last year. Yeah. Also, I know they locked him up to a long-term deal, and they didn't necessarily need to do that, but he's not making endless baseball money, you know? He is not holding back their payroll. He is not the big money dude, right? So now he is a big contributor to this team, and one of the reasons why they're off to a decent start. They didn't win these games last year. They would come back sometimes, right? Mm-hmm. On a game like this, this would be eight nothing, and they'd lose eight seven, and you'd be like, "Oh shit!" Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, is this- they would lose one run games. They'd lose late games. They'd lose uh, extra inning games. They were just, <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of things happening until they got hot in April. I mean, in in September, they what were they? O and eleven or O and fourteen in extra inning games? Like that is a crazy stat, and that's. 
that's demoralizing. AJ will tell you that is deflating when you claw and you scratch to get all the way back to one run or to tie it. And you're like, yes, we got this. Uh, and for them to come out on top, they're going to, they're, they're going to hit the baseball. Is their pitching enough? Do they have enough outside of that top five in their lineup? Who knows? Tough division. Yeah, but here, here's my whole thing on that is their, their starters, I think, are going to be fine with Darvish and, and Musgrove and some of the other ones. Mm -hmm. The question for me is more, can they bridge it to Suarez at the end? Can they bridge that gap, six, seven, eight, nine? Yuki. Right? Yeah, Yuki Matsui. Yeah. But there's so many quite and uh, what's his name? We saw Gu. Go, we saw Go. Or, yeah. He's in the minor leagues, right? So I, I I don't know. Is there enough there? I mean, I think there's some there's some holes in the uh, Padres, but I mean they're fun to watch. Mm -hmm. That's they're, they're just fun to watch. Yeah, Yuki's off to a good start, although he's not striking guys out. But Doesn't, six in yeah. the third, right? And he's, he's got the stuff to do it. What am I missing there? I don't know. I, and I and I look at any of his peripherals with like exit velocity or anything like that. He hasn't let up runs, which is a big thing, but. <laughs> At some point, if you're coming in the seventh, eighth, ninth inning, if if Suarez is down, you got to be able to get punch outs. That's how the Orioles lost the other night. Cano is nasty, but at some at certain situations, you need punch outs, and the bullpen you got to punch guys out. Yeah, he's a one four two ERA right now. It's six and a third. Um, Statcast has him at a three six seven expected ERA. Yeah, super low whiff percentage, chase, the whole deal. He's not getting swing and miss. And there's some hard hit contact, so we'll see what happens. That could change, but for now it's working. Another crazy game, <laughs> Mets-Braves. A lot of Mets fans on socials were like, this is a game we lose. This is not a game that we usually win. <laughs> In Atlanta, losing, we come back twice. They're like, even... With Brendan Nimmo hitting two homers that ended up bringing them back into it, they were like, still, usually you get to a point where the eighth or ninth inning, the Braves had chances, and you know they'd come back and win the game. That's what Mets fans are used to recently because they have gotten shoved by the Braves the last couple of years. Yes. Right? So this was standout for them. Ninth inning, right? You have the Olsen double. Marcel Azuna had a long fly ball out. Then Harris had the RBI single. And Travis Darno with a long fly ball out because they were sitting most of their high leverage relievers because they had used them in three of the last four, most of their big boys, Rayleigh, Adovino, and Edwin Diaz. So good for the Mets getting the dub in Atlanta when they're going to be an underdog against the Braves all year. Yes. I mean, it's one game. That's, yeah, it's a fun game to watch, though. It, yeah, there's there's a lot of fun games to watch yesterday. You know, if you're Papelbon, the White Sox Royals game or – Sorry, the, the, White, the White Sox game. Our Guardians game was fun to watch. I mean, there was a lot of fun games to watch yesterday. Yeah, but for the Mets, Nimmo, Nimmo had been two homers because he's been struggling. Three for 29, no homers, first nine games, and then he went four for four with five ribbies You yesterday. see Alvarez's throw, too, off the backstop? I don't know if I oh, caught that. I didn't well, see it. You didn't see that? Uh, Matt Olson, oh. there was a wild pitch, like, boom, it hit the backstop. He caught it and whew, fired him out a second. That was pretty sweet. For real? Oh, and was that That's the awesome. first? Was that the first base runner they caught? Because I think entering yesterday. I mean, does that count? That's a stolen base. Yeah, it's a caught stealing. It's caught stealing, right? I think entering yesterday they were zero for seventeen. I think. Really? On catch oh, nine games. I'm oh. pretty sure that's what they were. I had seen Mike Petriello tweet about it, and then he had said that the Diamondbacks only had one attempt against them entering yesterday. And I was like, it's crazy because one of the stories was Francisco Alvarez catching base runners in spring training. It's one of those spring training March fool situations Anomalies. where you're like, oh, yeah, this guy's going to get everyone. And it's quite the opposite. They were probably timing him like, yeah, that's not going to work in the regular season. The Brewers the Brewers definitely did their advanced scouting not on spring training because the Brewers <laughs> ran wild. The Brewers, yes, everybody was just getting on and they were just going. Nobody was giving them a chance. I mean, he was making the decent throws. Did Reese get one or two? Really? Ah, uh, that good. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it was know. like, it was like Cheerio, Yelly, Freelick, and then and then the next time through the order, I think they, 
Anyway, no I, I got to look it up. It doesn't matter, but it was they were they were running wild. That's for sure. Mm. Yeah, the Mets got had Tehran on the mound, thinking it's 2010 or something. Julio Tehran, who actually shut the Mets down year after year when he was with ATL, and he was good. What are you going to say? I, I know what Kratz going to say. He looked pretty good those first two innings, and then Julio? things fell apart. I love Julio. And last year, he looked good. Last he pitched year great for too. the Brewers. Eh, he pitched all right for he the had Brewers. A four and a half expected was a five. Like, oh my yeah. gosh! Eh. Better than better than uh, Kratz. Better than Scotty's ERA. Great. <laughs> I mean, dude with a twenty-seven ERA has a better ERA. I, I, you don't want me to be critical? A four and a half is good? I mean, well, you're old. <laughs> four and a half? I mean, four and a half. Probably not that old. Four and a half is, is, to me, more than you can expect of a guy who hadn't been in the big leagues for two years and then comes in and gives you meaningful innings. A team that won, they don't win, they don't win the Central without him. How about that? Like, his four and a half, you can't just True. call guys up from AAA and be Disagree. like. Disagree. Hey, have a four and a half in the minor leagues. I mean, have a four and a half in the show. Disagree. Okay. By, by the way, I just he's wanna... thirty three, and the Brewers cleared the the Central last year by nine games. They win the division with or without Julio Tehran. You guys are way too gracious. He's good. He's good in the past, but enough. I like Julio. He's a good guy. So I know. You know I'm giving come him. Come on. By the way, other exciting games yesterday. The Reds game and the Milwaukee game was crazy too. I don't know how much of that you watch. Wow. And then the Dodgers game. Shohei going. Phew, Oppo. He had four missiles in that game, by the way. He is swinging it. Five straight games of multi-hits. Five straight. First I mean, time in his career. And did, Somebody's did anybody see just on hitting. Did you see Buxton's catch yesterday? That was that was a good catch. Sick. You, but, but how many times do you watch him dive and you're like, just get up? And he got oh, up well, and he's he's like. He was tipping his cap. He was oh, bowing. He was, lo- he was feeling it, which I love. I loved it. The pitcher's giving him a – but, I mean, that ball, Shohei hit. He, it was 42-degree launch angle, oppo. I don't understand. He plays a different game. I mean, that's game. like – 42 degrees is, like, high for a homer, especially yeah. oppo. That people were worried about him. It had been a whole week without a home run from Shohei Otani. And it happens to everybody. The last five games. I know. That's what I'm saying. That's what we do. We overreact in the beginning. And then, yeah, of course. I mean, we were going to do it later, but – Let's spend two minutes on it now before we get to our first guest. Ellie De La Cruz. Slow. Smashed a homer. Slow. 450 feet off the batter's eye in the fifth inning yesterday against Milwaukee off a 94-mile-an-hour fastball as a left-handed hitter. Then shows up later on as a right-handed hitter. Line drive. Looks like a single. Sal Freelich dives for it. Ellie's like, that's a mistake. And also the... Pitcher's rubber helped him out a little bit, too, on that throwback. But still, 15 seconds home to home. Another dinger. He's 297, 366, and 595 slug. Is that good? Yeah, that's he was that early when he got called up last year, too. So let's let's pump. pump, pump, You guys are such haters. Pump pump the brakes. Come on. How how sick was that yesterday? I mean, it was great. Listen, I mean, he's got all the tools. And we saw this last year. Remember we came up and Kratzy and and Scott was like, you should be in the home run derby and hitting inside the park homers. And then you look at his numbers at the end of the year, and you're like, all right, wait a minute. Now, listen, this ball was touched. And then the, the inside of the park was was awesome. But, I mean, let's let's slow down. We're, we're, we're 10 games into the season. Let's let's take a deep breath, and let's slow down. I'm I'm waiting for Kratz if he's got anything to add. Which side he's taking here. He's, he won so the game. Cool Ellie won see, the game. He scored four times. It's so cool to see prospects do well. In games, (laughs) but, but my whole thing with C Trent was if this team is a playoff contending team, can they deal with his struggles when he has them right-handed? He might be a liability right-handed just being, just being flat out honest. And when C Trent said he doesn't need to go down to the minor leagues to work on anything, that would be one thing. His power, like it's unbelievable. I've seen, I've seen a few people hit the batter's eye. I've seen uh, Adam Dunn go on top of the ship out there in center field. That was a joke. So for a guy to be able to hit a ball that far and then to be able to run in under 15 seconds on inside the park, I mean, the only person that did it faster was Adam Rosales on a over-the-fence home run. So, yes, supremely talented, 
supremely talented. Can he can he clog up the holes in his swing that a team that is a good team can exploit? And that will be the biggest thing. I'm not crowning him MVP. I'm not even crowning him an all-star yet. To me, he needs to clog those holes up in his swing to be able to – he was – before this game, he was striking out 50% of his at-bats. That is not – that is not good for the rest of the, for the rest of the season. I know it won't. You be guys that are putting high. too much on him. No, you are putting too much on. You him. guys are putting too. I much just on said him. pump the brakes. How is that putting too much on him? Because what, is the one you said what's going to happen? Can this team make the playoffs if he goes? Through I never struggles? said that. He's one human out of twenty six on an active that. roster. I never said that. I didn't I say. Could they I make picked the him to win the division. Okay, what about Kratz? I don't know what Kratz said. Sometimes he, I I space out. <laughs> I pick. Yeah, I talk too much, but. I picked them to win the division. My question is, if he struggles at shortstop, is the leash just unlimited? Is it a Anthony yeah. Volpe, we're going to let him hit through this throughout the yes. year because we have gold gloves? They're just going to let him play. Yeah. Okay. Especially but, when you have a player that has all the tools. Yeah. I mean, they let O'Neill Cruz, and I mean, he got hurt, but they were going to let him go. Yeah, but O'Neill Cruz, Cruz was on a last place team. That's my question. If you're on a playoff contending team, which I don't think anybody here disagrees that they're on a playoff, that the Reds are a playoff contending team, you can't at some point. Where's that leash? Where is that leash? And that is my only question. He's not question. going anywhere. He's, He's not, not going, going anywhere. anywhere. He's going to stay there all year. So about I'm, it, I'm not worried struggles. about it. It's one person worried about it. This guy. That guy. Does he do other things well? Yeah, he does. He he runs. He I mean, he makes plays when he, he – but he does also – listen. His D young. upside's high, though. His, his D upside is high. He's got an arm. He can hit for power. I mean, he struggled last year. We saw it. They're not sending him down, though. So, I mean, we need to stop talking about it. I mean, unless it, just the wheels fall off, which probably is not going to happen. He's too talented. No chance. He's not going anywhere. Plus, he's a big part. You watch him in the dugout. He's a huge part of the organization and the team. So, he's not going anywhere. But before we get to our first guest, I have to say, you see my hat. You know, I got, I got to say this at the top. 4-9 mm -hmm. today, Tim Wakefield, RIP. I love you, Wake. I miss you every day. Um, they're doing a big thing for him today with the 0-4 team in Boston, their home opener. I mean, it just happened to fall on 4-9, and it's four, obviously his number was 49. And his daughter, Brianna, is throwing out the first pitch. So just enjoy it. Have a great time. Thank you, Red Sox, for doing what you're doing for one of the – Greatest people I ever met in my life in Tim Wakefield, and let's see how it goes. Yeah, one of a kind. One of a kind. Just a terrible offseason for the family. Oh, can All you imagine that. losing your mom and your dad? No. 18 years old, and you have a brother that has special needs? Yeah, tragedy within <clears throat> weeks of each other. Just yeah. just an awful story. Um, and we'll cover that a little bit later on, too, when we get to the end. Time for our first guest of the day. Recently retired. It was last September. And now, big wig working in the bigs. Sean Doolittle joining us right now on FT Live. Do how you doing, man? Good to see you. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. How's life? What are you up to? Oh, man. I'm I'm a working man now. You know, I, I took the, uh, the job as pitching strategist with the Nats in January. And... Um, you know, it's been uh, it's been a whirlwind. I've been learning a lot, and I, I've been really enjoying it. Um, so, traveling with the team and everything, and we're in San Francisco right now, getting ready for Game Two of three game series with the Giants. What the heck is a pitching strategist? <laughs> <laughs> and did you do it? Did you did you negotiate it and be like, uh, I want to do whatever Howie Kendrick does for the Phillies? <laughs> but just with the pitching side, like I just, I just want to be in the uniform and hang out with guys and touch baseballs and stuff. Yeah, it's like the meme where there's like the the dog gets a photo in the yearbook where like I'm just kind of like hanging out like a mascot. Um, um, but it's like uh, it's it's a fancy title for. Um, I'm kind of like a, a Swiss Army knife dealing with the pitchers. Um, you know, as we get more and more information in the game, there's just so much for the pitching coach and the bullpen coach to sift through. 
uh, to bring back to the players uh, on a daily basis. So um, I'm another set of eyes um, that can help. Um, I'm, I can help give feedback to the players. I deal more probably with some of the, the analytics stuff. Um, I work with our biomechanists a lot, uh, monitoring guys' movements and mechanics during games and uh, the workloads and stuff like that. Um, you know, helping put put a game plan together, sitting down with the pitcher and the catcher and, and the pitching coach before each game and going over the, the opposing hitters and uh, prepping the guys for the, the, the whole series. Um, so it, it, it's a, a fancy sounding title for, you know, an assistant pitching coach, basically. All right. So I, I got to ask this because I faced you a bunch of times. You threw one pitch. So how can you be a pitching strategist? You threw a fastball. <laughs> I mean, it's like not everybody can get away with that. So it's not like you're like, man, you really need to mix in a changeup because you were like, all right, I'm throwing a fastball, and I might yeah, throw, throw a, like a little slider curveball every you know 20 pitches. But it was like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at you like this, and then I'm gonna throw a fastball right down my elbow, and you're gonna try and hit it. No one can hit it. So I think I think that's a that's a fair question. Um, I think and. One thing that we talk a lot about with our guys is is, is pitching to your strengths. Um, obviously, my strength was the fastball and the deception that I created, and um, I was able to make a career. Uh, I threw it 90% of the time. Um, there's something to be said. I probably took it to the extreme during my career, but there's something to be said about throwing your pitches with conviction and, and, and having that trust in your stuff. Um, I think that's where analytics can help guys understand why their stuff is so good, why their stuff can play uh, and be effective in the big leagues. Um, you know, uh, I think such a big part of pitching, especially we talk a lot about uh, controlling counts, uh, getting ahead of hitters. Um, and if you understand your stuff and the way that your stuff plays, uh, I think that gives you more confidence to attack the strike zone, um, to put a game plan together where you're not out there on the mound uh, during your outing trying to figure it out on the fly or, you know, hoping that this pitch is going to work. If maybe I can put it in this zone, um, you know, really trying to get a guy, get guys to understand, um, you know, from now this is, and, and it's not just me hyping them up, right. It's, it's getting them to understand this is why your stuff is good. Uh, and this is why it's going to be effective against this, this, pitcher you know throw it with conviction um you know and, and i i tell i tell them all the time i mean i understand it's it's weird yes coming from me i'm uh, we're we're working on you know maybe a different pitch for the guy he's working on a cutter or, or a change up and <clears throat> it, it 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 is almost like the old adage that those that can't do teach um i couldn't throw a cut i tried i i I spent, you know, all 11 years when I was in the league trying to, you know, get a better secondary pitch. And I think from trying to learn so many different pitches, I understand, you know, maybe how to teach it, if that makes sense. I understand because I talked to so many guys. I went to facilities during the off season to work on pitch design and stuff like that. Um, you know, so I, I can I understand the concepts enough behind them um, to where like I can I can give guys ideas and things to try. Um, we can we can get on the edgertronic cameras and track uh, what your hands doing as the ball's coming out and basically run an experiment to try to see if a tweak here or a grip change this way, you know, might help your shape and stuff like that. So. Um, yeah, it's been it, it's been a lot of fun. I've been learning a lot about you know how to convey information. I, I get to work with Jim Hickey. He's our pitching coach, and um, I've learned a ton from him already. Um, so it's been a, it's been really good. I'm really lucky. What if all this tweaking and you find this pitch and you're like you look on the on the edgetronic, you look on the stack cast, and this pitch is nasty, nastiest pitch <laughs> out there, and you're like, yeah, we did this. But the biomechanic <laughs> people guy go, goes, hey, this is really putting a lot of strain on his elbow. Maybe we should limit this pitch because mm -hmm. your, your, your whole job is to make this pitch as nasty as possible. And you said, hey, this is what pitch works. But what if somebody on your staff says, that pitch, that pitch could cause some injury? Where do you stand yeah. then as the pitch, pitching strategist who also played 
and was successful for a long time. Yeah. So the first thing that we do, like, you know, we had guys in spring training, we were running pitch design sessions and stuff like that, where we're working on developing a specific pitch for a guy. And the first, the first place we would start is actually a, a conversation with the training staff and the strength coaches and the biomechanists and go back to their intake from spring training, uh, the physical that they went through. Do they have any limitations? Are there any red flags in their um, in, in their intake? Do they have any strength deficiencies uh, from, a, from a movement and mobility standpoint? Do they have any limitations? Are they biased? Some guys are biased towards pronation. Some guys are biased towards supination. Um, are we working against um, just how his body is constructed you know, hunting this pitch shape, um, you know, okay, if he doesn't have any limitations, um, what does he do well already? Um, is he a guy that, you know, going back to the bias uh, of pronation and supination at, at ball release, um, is he a guy, can we lean into what he does well already uh, when we're tinkering with certain things? And maybe he shouldn't be hunting, you know, a sweeper because he's not really good at, at supinating. Um, maybe we should, we should look more, uh, you know, into a different shape that fits in well with just how his body naturally moves. Um, and you know, that a big part of my job is trying to create a holistic approach, um, within the organization for guys when we talk about, you know, pitch design and, and, you know, pitch you know, usage during games, usage over the course of the season, where we're looping in the training staff and the strength coaches um, and, and the biomechanists so that um, we're trying to cover all those bases and account for, you know, all, any variable that we can control. How do we stop this? Is, it, is that the recipe? Is that the recipe that you guys are trying to <clears throat> to hope guys don't get injured how do how do we stop this as an industry obviously you can't com completely stop it but how do we at least like curtail it a little bit yeah i mean so that's the recipe that that, that we're that we're trying um we feel like the communication has been good um and the reality is that i think in in Major League Baseball, we've kind of created a bit of a monster, um, and uh, with guys hunting velocity and uh, and spin. And uh, I saw you know, Dallas Braden put out a tweet the other day that um, I, I thought summed it up really well. Just I'm paraphrasing, but his words were basically that we've basically reached the the peak of uh, the human body's ability to you know, capture velocity and, and create torque uh, coming down the mound to create, you know, some of the nastiest pitches and the highest velocities. Um, I think it's, uh, I think so, like, it's, it's our fault in, in Major League Baseball because we've incentivized those things, right? We've incentivized the velocities and, and um, the nasty breaking pitches and stuff like that because even if a guy – um, might not be getting results. A guy that's throwing 96 to to 100 with that can spin the ball, you know, 3,000 RPMs on his breaking ball is going to get. He's going to get, you know, multiple chances at the big league level because you know teams think that they'll be able to unlock that, and it's only a matter of time before this guy becomes an absolutely nasty uh, reliever at the back end for somebody. Um, so we've. You know, players see that, and and uh, I mean, maybe I thought uh, maybe this started to change. This started to change during my career. I thought maybe in in 2016, 2017, you started to see a shift in the way that guys, at, at least in and around the big leagues, trained. Um, that's when the ball started flying out of the ballpark, and pitchers started to feel like they had to do something extra. Um, in their training on the off season to add a few ticks of velocity or, or create a, a better breaking shape. Um, and it, you, you have to, tr guys are training like that now, um, shoot going to, in middle school and high school, because that's what, that's the, that's what's going to get guys to college, right. Is, you know, being able to flash mid to upper nineties, um, you know, being able to spin the ball 
uh, guys are guys in high school are you know focusing solely on baseball and training uh, in ways you know specifically geared toward hunting velocity um, at, at a much younger age so by the time they get through high school through college into the minor leagues uh, and into the big leagues they have more miles on their arm they, they put their body through a lot more uh, as far as the, the training methods um, you know because their their whole thing has been geared towards creating these velocities and these shapes on a track man or a rap soto um, not necessarily like you know understanding how to necessarily pitch and get out and compete in a game but you know pitching to a to a track man and, and trying to create the sexiest shapes um, so I think like unfortunately like we got to play the long game here and we have to change the way that I think we we value pitchers, the way that we use pitchers, um, you know, and when I say and, and and the way that we train, I think a lot of times when guys are training, you know, they're doing plyo balls and they're lifting heavy in the weight room and they're and they're they're doing a velo program in the off season to hunt velocity. I think a lot of times the cart gets put before the horse and. Um, the guy that starts doing the plyo balls, has he gone through, you know, a, a, a screening or an assessment uh, on the front end? Do we understand how he moves? Uh, does he have the range of motion to be using plyo balls? Because the plyo balls, the velocity that you get from training with plyo balls is because the heavier object takes you into more extreme ranges. Can this guy handle those extreme ranges? And when he gets to those extreme ranges, does he have the stability and the strength at those extreme ranges to get in and out of those positions to create velocity? Um, and if not, then we have to start there and and make sure that we're starting from a foundation where this guy has the strength to go through a program like that and to make that a part of his daily routine. Um, and then on the back end of that, there's extra stuff that you need to be doing if you're hunting a velocity program to protect yourself on the back end a little bit more uh, from a strength standpoint, from an arm care standpoint. Um, you know, it, it, nothing's happening in a vacuum here. Um, the pitch clock certainly is not helping. That feels like the lowest hanging fruit maybe. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it, it's the world that we live in now. So we ha as coaches, like we have to figure out a way, um, you know, to make sure that we're, we're helping guys. The, the issue that we're seeing is a lot of times by the time these guys get into minor league ball and, 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 up, and up to the big leagues, um, like I said, like we're trying to kind of uh, with some guys like relay that foundation, um, you know, as we're asking this guy to compete in games and get outs for us. Sean, uh, let's go on to something a little more fun. You mentioned Dallas <laughs> Braden earlier. Yeah. You mentioned Dallas Braden earlier. When you're in the Bay Area, do people ever come up to you and say, Dallas, I love that perfect game you threw? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I played here just long enough that that, that some people would, would know the difference between us. Um, but, uh, no, I have I haven't gotten that one yet. Okay, because I'm like, if you put on the the hat, the hat was with that newsboy hat that he wears. Yeah, he's got you the guys flat cap. Simil yeah, yeah, and you have similar beards. If you were just walked around Oakland, I guarantee you, at least one person would be like, "Dallas, man, I love you on uh, NBC <laughs> Bay Area." I'll try it. We go there after we play the Giants, so we go across the bay. I'll try it. I'll just wander around Jack London Square. Okay. All right. All right. I want to see it, and then you got to film it and send it to us too, because it's okay, it's gonna I'll happen. <laughs> I think if you just get on the BART, right? If you go from San Fran to Oakland and yeah. you have, you're on the BART, someone's going to say, be, at when least the, somebody, will, there'll be at least a double take where there's going to be someone sitting there like, with a Braden jersey on. Put a Dallas Braden jersey on, and somebody will come up to you and say something. I got to I gotta up my shoe game, too. Dallas has good has good shoe game. I got to, so if we put, we put some Nike some Nike Air Force Ones on, or something like that. Some dunks, maybe, uh, and the flat cap. I bet. I bet we could. We could trick some people for sure. Yes. All right. I like it. I like it. All right. Now let's go. Let's talk about Oakland. How do you feel about them not being <laughs> Oakland anymore? How do you feel about them being somewhere out west in the state of California, maybe Nevada? Uh, athletics. 
it's heartbreaking, man. It's infuriating. Um, I feel awful for the fans. Um, I feel, um, I feel, I feel really bad for the people that work in that organization. Um, you know, because when, once you get under ownership, um, you know, the, the people who's, who are working for that club behind the scenes, the, in the training room and the clubhouses, uh, the, you know, the, the, um, the ushers, the security guards, the people that work at the stadium, um, you know, like they're in limbo right now. And, and I don't think that's, I don't, I don't think that's fair for everything that they do to the club. It, the fans are in limbo because, um, you know, I, I don't know if anybody, I don't know what this Vegas move is, if it's actually going to happen or not. Um, they're, I think they're, they're getting more pushback there than they thought they were going to. Um, but, you know, from a fan standpoint, they lost the Warriors. They lost the Raiders in the last few years. Um, and now they, it looks like, you know, they're, they're losing the, the A's as well. So um, I, I feel so lucky to have played in Oakland um, for that fan base, um, for that organization. That organization gave me a shot to change the course of my career uh, when I switched to pitching. Um, so I'll, I'll always be grateful for my time in Oakland and playing for those fans. Um, it was a special time. Obviously, the Coliseum is way past its prime, and um, the, the, the players and the fans deserve a, a better ballpark um, to call home. But, uh, you know, moving the team, you know, into this purgatory situation in, in Sacramento before they maybe go somewhere else uh, to Vegas or otherwise, um, it just it, it just it feels like a failure. I, I feel awful for the fans. It, the thing, it doesn't make sense it, to me. Like, you know, shoot, when I saw, I got drafted and I signed um, my my contract, uh, I got to go to the Coliseum and I, I signed a contract in Billy Bean's office and, and he had the renderings for a new ballpark. This was 2007. And, and that was that was supposed to be in Fremont in the South Bay. Um, and, you know, my my entire time in pro ball this has it's been an ongoing conversation um about where the team's gonna move and you know at and at the end like you know the city of oakland finally got there and uh, they were given more money and a and a bigger you know space right on the water downtown oakland and you know they decided that they wanted that nine acre plot near the airport in vegas and i like i just from a I'm not an architect, but like nine acres, not a ton to work with. Um, like, how are you going to create a, 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 a good experience for the players and the fans on such a small space? You know, while you're taking, you're taking, and you're taking a team away from such a loyal fan base. Um, you know, none, none of it, none of it adds up. And, and, and I, I feel for the people that are kind of caught in between here. By the way, uh, you mentioned something earlier before we go dig into this a little bit deeper, but people forget you were like a two-way guy coming out of Virginia. So <laughs> yeah. couldn't hit or well, you were like, wait a second here. This hitting thing is hard. Hitting was hitting is really hard. Um, but I, um, if you can believe it, uh, injuries derailed my, my time as a hitter. Uh, when I was in the minor leagues, I, I tore my patellar tendon in my left knee twice and I tore a tendon in my wrist. Uh, my right wrist on a swing and a miss in 2011. So by that time, I had missed um, all of 2009, 2010, and 11 with injuries. And going back to when I signed, the, the A's had said, um, we liked you because you came with an insurance plan. And, you know, if in four or five years it's not working out, um, you know, they said home plate's not moving. So, uh, we, you know, we might we might want to explore that. Um, it, and I was approached by our farm director, Keith Lippman, in uh, the summer of 2011, uh, after I had torn up, tore a tendon in my wrist, and I was in a cast, and um, they came to me and asked if I wanted to start a throwing program, um, and um, I, I was doing my wrist rehab in the mornings, uh, trying to come back as a hitter, and in the afternoons, I was working on, I was long tossing, I was working on mechanics and, and thinking about pitching. And 
that that summer progressed and the wrist didn't recover the way that we thought and i was looking at uh, a surgery with a, a really long um, recovery timeline uh, and so i asked to switch i had started throwing some bullpens and and live bps at that point and uh they said like well, yeah like they brought an advanced scout to watch me throw a, a live bp uh in arizona at the complex and uh by the by that night um they had called the assistant gm had called and said i could switch um if i wanted to and and he was he explained he's like you're gonna have to start back in the bus leagues and we're gonna bring you to instructs and you know we'll basically just see how this goes and um so yeah like uh, I, I was really 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 lucky to get that second chance and uh, i'm a uh, i'll always be grateful for the way that the 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 people in oakland the staff the way that they handled that like i had the time because i was in a cast i had the time to build my arm up before I, you know i really started letting it rip on the mound and um but never and never going through that process at, at any point did i was i thinking like oh my gosh like this is my ticket to to get to the show and establish myself in the big leagues like i i was just so far at the end of my rope having missed three full seasons with injury that like I was just looking for a way to get back on the field. Um, I didn't have any expectations for it. I was just enjoying being able to do something other than rehab for a little bit. At what point in your big league career then did you stop looking at hitters and being like, dude, bro, this guy sucks. I could have totally <laughs> made it. At what point did you like stop becoming, because right after you're done hitting, you're like the best hitter ever. You're like, I am never, I would, if I was still hitting, I would never get out. And then at one point you're like, <laughs> I mean, I I think I I probably still do it like to an extent, but like I can vividly remember like sitting in the bullpen in Oakland, like you know, and we're we're tucked down the left field line there on the field, and um, just like watching guys and just being like, just take it the other way, like just stay on, <laughs> just stay inside it, and like and then like in like the very next breath, I'm like. It's uh, it's so hard, and I'm so glad I don't have to do that anymore. Maybe I'm a control freak, and I like pitching because I like dictating. I like being in control. Um, you know, hitting, you're just reacting. And it's especially now as the games progress where the average fastball velo is up around 95 miles an hour. Um, when I came into the league, that was hard. Um, <laughs> like, I threw, nine, I threw 95, and, and, and that, was, that was gas. Um, and now it's like... That's the that's stock. That's stock. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. I used to throw hard. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I wanna, out. <laughs> well, I, I want to finish with this because I know Dew will like this. So the other day, AJ was telling a story about getting called up or, you know, getting up from the minors real quick and then working with a veteran who just is like, yep, let's figure it out. And I remember, what was it? Brad Radke told mm -hmm. him, just use the force. So <laughs> it got me thinking, Sean Doolittle's a pretty big Star Wars fan. And I would say a, a viral moment in my life that stood out in 2019 was oh, dude, yeah. going all out. Do you remember this? And then it went went nuts. Like we were cracking up. I was with Dan Plesak at the time. And um, he, he just kind of showed up behind us and was like, hey, guys, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They they pulled me out like they pulled me out there and you guys like Kyle our our PR guy was like they asked for you like go over there and I was like they they're very clearly in the middle of talking and he was like no like just go like we're just sending guys like back and forth from the celebration to do some media stuff and then back and forth and and so um, yeah the the lightsaber was just one of those weird things that that I had during the playoff run we had all kinds of different stuff going on um in the clubhouse uh and uh it ran out of batteries um finally um after game seven so it it lasted we had we had shoot i think it i think it lived through four champagne celebrations um and so i had it when i had it for the parade it, it was toast it, it, it the battery port had like rusted over from all the champagne and it the no, I couldn't save it. Um, so it's got a very special place in my house now. Um, 
but uh, we had that, that. That was a lot of fun. That was awesome. Yeah, and hey, it served its purpose. It made it through the series. It did. And then it was. It did. I had to. I spent time cleaning the inside. I had to clean the inside before the World Series because it it started to it started to short out. Well, the battery ports were were. It was a mess after three sam three champagne celebrations. We had to get it through one more. So use the force, baby. <laughs> I love it. Well, dude, it was great catching up with you, man. Keep it up. Uh, excited to see the work that you do with the Nats pitchers. And uh, thanks for the time. Thanks for having me, guys. Hey, dude, by the way, before you go, I just want to say this. Next time when if I drive all the way down to Palm Beach, bro, and we chase you down, I know all we're asking for is 30 <laughs> seconds, dude. That's it. Just 30 quick seconds. It's okay. I'm sorry. I was I was very new in my job, and I didn't want to, like, I was like, no, I have to get out to the game. Like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I, I didn't want Riz. I didn't want Rizzo to see me like, like he's, you know, what see me on foul territory. He's like, you're supposed to be in the bullpen helping the pitcher get ready for the game. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we had Davey on. I figured, you know, you could follow Davey at least. Davey's in charge. I, was, I didn't. I was. I felt like a rookie all over in spring training again. And the, and and the producer for your show came up and was like, can we get like, can we just get a couple minutes? And I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm so sorry. Like I think I got to be out for the game. Like I didn't know like what the rules were. Um, so I apologize, uh, but I'm glad it worked out. I, I like talking to you guys. I like seeing your stuff on social media, and uh, I appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Thanks. That was great, by the way, because, uh, you know, Matt LeCroy, meanwhile, was dying. He's like, I got to go watch a sim game. And Matt LeCroy's like, can I come on the show? We're like, no. <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> he's we'll the best, back. man. He's the best. Oh, he's the best. He is the best. <laughs> Well, Sean, thanks again, man. We'll we'll catch you down the road. Actually, we might be in D.C., so we'll catch you there. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Appreciate you, thanks, Sean guys. Doolittle, joining us. Thank you on FT Live. That was fun. Dude, there's like a long list of guys that stood us up at spring training. We're just hitting, we're checking them off. Now I'm finding the them season. out because I was in AJ there. doesn't I know. forget. AJ no, doesn't I'm, forget. I told you I'm very petty. For, I've, I've always said that. But so <laughs> when we were at Nats Camp, Mark, our EP, chased him down it was like can we get you and mark's sweating you know he's from jersey just sweating <laughs> in florida and meanwhile we're just baking in the sun that was where i got sunburnt you know and he chases him down and we get him on and you know uh claudia chased down uh woods and he said no and then you know james then, wood all, yeah. yeah james wood and then we're so it's just funny like there's all these guys that have like said no and then all of a sudden now we're getting them on the regular season so it's funny they're going to be calling us. Hey, can I come on foul territory? Well, what? This be like well, three you blew Claudia now. off. <laughs> three years that from now, be like, well, March 12th, 2024, AJ said you didn't say hi to him. So, no. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. Petty. No, I will say this. Almost every guy I asked, there's only one guy that I asked that said yes, that didn't come on. That said yes, that didn't come on. Mm -hmm. But I can't wait defense, that person comes on. In his defense, it was a rain delay, and there was the PA was there that day, so it was it was in St. Louis. But you know, I understand why. Yeah, I know oh, who it was. I know who it was. Yeah, you can say it's who okay. it is. We'll no, get him no. again. It was Arnado. It, it was, was Arnado. No, no, no. But I get why he couldn't come on because yeah, he because it was a rain delay. The PA meeting went long. Yes, and they were rain, so they were and they were rushing to get to the game. And I listen, no, 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 nothing, nothing wrong. No. Yeah, no. The good news is we're on every day, so at some point yeah. this season. Next time I do a Cardinals game, oh, I'm going to drag him. Yeah, there like, we go. You're, by his ear. you're coming. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to our next guest. We're excited to be joined by a special guest right now, Dr. Keith Meister, who has been you know, outspoken about the arm injuries that have been going on and obviously has, has worked with so many pitchers on, on fixing their arms. Uh, Dr. Meister, great to have you on. And I hey, have guys. to imagine how you doing. This It's probably a weird time for you, right? Because you, you've been outspoken about this, and it's not fun this, to have so many people visiting you with these problems, right? Yeah, I, I, this is uh, – I've been doing this 30-plus years now. And, AJ, how you doing, man? I haven't seen you in a long time. I'm, uh, I know, brother. How are you? You never – listen, my elbow still feels fucking great, okay? So, you know, you, you never touched me. I don't know if you ever even touched me. We'd say hi to each other in the training I room. That. Brother, I, was gonna, I, I mean, I was going to say, man, he never touched me, so we're good. <laughs> yeah. And you landed exactly where you need to be. <laughs> That's right. 
He's using he's using different <laughs> muscles now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, hey, how, actually, not first, really, not really. <laughs> hey, so first of all, how are things out yeah. there? And I and I have to ask yeah. this because you know the Rangers have not got their City Connect uniforms yet. Nope. So how on earth did you get your City Connect polo if the team doesn't have their jerseys yet? <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I, I guess I'm in that VIP line. You're <laughs> a guy. Get some respect. <laughs> You're a guy. Yep. I got yeah. it. <laughs> I've been around long enough, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> well, let's the, I know you're I'm a busy sorry. man. Let's get into the tough yeah. stuff. No, no, all good. That, my, th- these guys are the fun ones. I unfortunately will bring some <laughs> Grim Reaper advice here. But just, you know, with the conversation sparking up again recently about elbow injuries, c- can you tell us what, what your stance is and – what you've communicated to the league about how to fix the problem that we're dealing with? You know, I, it's, um, yeah, I, I guess I have spoken a lot more about it than, than, uh, than any time in the past. I, I feel like, uh, this is a, a health issue and, uh, this is the population of, of patients that I take care of. And, and so if I can offer some valuable advice per, potentially at least keep the conversation going in the right direction, then, then maybe we can do some good here because you're right. I mean, the, the numbers are, are absolutely astronomical. They're through the roof. Um, we're probably double what we were at any, any time uh, at this time of the year before. Um, I did about 230 elbow ligaments last year. Uh, I've done 70 just in the first quarter alone this year. Um, the month of April, I'll probably do 40 plus. Uh, and, and the preponderance of this is, is on the pro side, but we're seeing the same kind of spike on the college and the high school side. And, and I think that we've known for years that this increase in velocity, which has trended up as, as, has resulted in this, you know, this set of consequences. But, but I think there's a, a broader picture than this. I think the, what I like to call the designer pitches, I think has had a significant impact, uh, equally as well. Um, and I think that those of us that are seeing a lot of this stuff with great frequency are, are seeing these patterns um, over and over and over again now to the point at which I can tell you that I can look at an MRI scan almost and tell you that this pattern of injury is something that we're seeing with particular pitches. So we can almost look at an MRI and, and the type of tear and say, oh, this guy's throwing this kind of pitch. And so um, I, I think it's something that we need to take a, a, a broader look at. And, um, uh, and again, I think a lot of this is multifactorial, no question, but, but there's no question velocity and spin for me are, are two very, very significant additive risk factors here. And this is the way the game is being taught now at all ages. Um, what I've told MLB is this is not going to change at the younger ages until it changes at the upper brackets, because if the scouts are not going to start looking for anything different well, then everybody is going to train uh, as, as is required to be able to get a foot in the door, so to speak. So until we start to change the conversation and change the philosophy and, and swing the pendulum back, I don't see this getting any better. In fact, I don't th- see it stabilizing. I, I see it continuing to worsen, and, and it's tragic. Doc, so I, I heard what you just said, and, and obviously you're one of the <clears throat> foremost authorities on this whole thing. What do you mean by you can tell by what pitches they throw? So if a guy yanks a sweeper more side to side, mm-hmm. he has a different tear than a guy like ripping a fastball down. Is that kind of yes. what you mean by what you said? Yes, you can you can see that, especially on guys that have already had reconstructions. Because, you know, you know look, AJ, you've been around a long time. You've seen it enough. I mean, guys used to you do a, a TJ and that would be a career. He'd be fine. For, for the rest of his career. Then it would be like, oh, these things will last 10 to 12 years. And then it was like, well, maybe they'll get seven to eight. And now it's, these things are re-tearing in three to five years. And, and you're looking at the same procedure done by some very, very talented surgeons with a lot of experience, but yet the results aren't anywhere near what they used to be. And so we've had just these greater and greater challenges. And yes, the tear patterns are representative very often and the recurrent tear patterns representative very often of the types of pitches being thrown. And, you know, I've talked to my front office people. I've talked to a lot of baseball people about this. And I think that our nomenclature now is very, very antiquated. You know, we talk about fastballs and curveballs and sliders and changeups, but we all know that there are umpteen different numbers of changeups and umpteen different numbers of sliders that people throw. Um, and one of the things I do is every, every individual that comes in the office, I flip them a baseball and I say, 
Show me what you're throwing. Show me how you grip a baseball. Tell me about the pitches that you're throwing. So, you know, I do a, a somewhat of a deep dive into this. And then we start to talk about metrics. And for me, one of the major risk factors is horizontal ball movement. So forget about what you're calling these pitches, you know, whether it's a changeup or a slider, whether it's, you know, arm side run or, or opposite arm side run or whatnot. To me, it's horizontal ball movement, you know, and, and to create horizontal ball movement, you've got to grip the crap out of the baseball and then you have to cut it either pronated hard or supinated hard with a very, very firm grip. And it's causing this what we call eccentric load on the muscles on on the inner side of the elbow and then everywhere up the kinetic chain, meaning the Latin the teres, which we're seeing a huge number of tears in now that we never saw before uh, shoulder capsular tears. So I think they're all a consequence of of this change in pitch design. And um, and I, I think the data is there. And I think we just need to take a harder look at it. And And one of the things I've told baseball, I'm not against you know, any of these things ever being thrown again. It's just, we need to figure out what are the safe parameters with which we can do this? You know, what, what are the, it, what's the threshold in which a guy can throw off speed pitches or these particular types of off speed pitches and not cross a line where the injury risk spikes significantly. But I mean, you have teams now pushing guys in the minor leagues to throw 65, 70, 75% off speed stuff. And it's not a, it's not a circle change. It's it's all these movement pitches, these pitches with hor with horizontal movement and metrics, what I call a power change up and the sweeping slider in particular. And it, we need to look at what is the safe threshold with which to throw these with what frequency so we can begin to at least tutor guys a little bit more smartly. And I, I think the data is there. We need to look at it harder. When you say when you say threshold, do you mean <clears throat> the amount of times it's thrown? Because the person I always talk about is Araldus Chapman through 106 right. miles an hour and has never had Tommy John surgery. He doesn't go out and throw 106 miles an hour every pitch. Is it because these guys are throwing that horizontal moving pitch 60 to 70 percent of the time, or would they still get injured if they threw it, you know, 30 percent of the time? Like, which frequency are you looking at? How hard the pitch is thrown and spun, or is it that it's thrown? 30 times a game. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's yes, yes. I think the problem with those pitches is to throw them effectively, you have to put a max effort into that pitch. You have to really squeeze the crap out of the baseball to get 20 inches of horizontal movement on a sweeper. You know, to get 18 inches of, of you know, horizontal movement on a power changeup, you've got to squeeze the ball uh, very, very hard. So um, you're right. I mean, you know, Chaps, I mean, a great example. I mean, he, he's also a very big man and he, and he wasn't throwing sweepers. He was throwing a fastball. And I think a fastball alone, yes, it's a risk factor, but you also have to look at who's throwing it and how they're using the pitch and whatnot. And, and you're right. He's not throwing max effort every pitch, but I think those particular pitches to be able to throw them effectively, you have to throw them with a max effort. Number one, number two, yes. Frequency. Also, I think that if you start to take that max effort pitch and, and you run it out there 60, 70% of the time, well, then you got a double whammy there. I mean, you don't take your car out on the road and you don't take it and, and put the pedal to the metal every time you accelerate. And mm -hmm. I always say your best pitchers, your greatest pitchers in the game are the guys that know when to take their foot off the gas. They're not breaking, but they know that, that they don't have to throw the pitch the hardest every time they go out there. But the, the problem with those two pitches in particular is that you've got to throw it with a, with a, a, a certain degree of effort for them to be effective. I mean, we all know you drive a Ferrari, so I mean, your pedal is always the oh metal, man, okay? a Porsche and a Ferrari, you know, wrong guy, man. wrong guy, convertible. <laughs> you know, we know how it is. It's okay. That's why that analogy. Wrong guy. You make sense. <laughs> all right, you, you're mentioning all this stuff about grip and having to grip it harder. Do you think the mm. fact the lack of sticky stuff, or the lack of a tacky ball, or the lack of something to help pitchers get grip, is also helping these numbers continue to go up. Because if you have a stickier ball, you don't have to grip it as hard. And a lot of the pitchers now are complaining about a chalky ball, a slippery ball, right? Where in the past, I mean, I know spider tack or whatever, but they had a little pine tar. They'd go, you yeah, know, let me grab a little pine tar, a little hair gel, a little sunscreen, whatever it is, make it a little bit stickier. Now they can't do that. So they have a chalky ball, wet grip, and it's slipping. So they're like, gosh, I got to just rip this ball. And then it leads to, I mean, just me doing that. I'm like, man, I can feel it. Like, I mean, not, you know what I'm saying? So does he think that yeah. has any effect? 
I do, actually. I think that, you know, baseball will say that spin rates haven't changed since they've taken away the tack in the game. Um, pitchers accommodate, though. I mean, they're talented, you know, talented athletes, and they're resourceful, and they've accommodated. But unfortunately, that accommodation is exactly as you say. It's, it's having to squeeze the ball that much harder. And I can't believe that that isn't having some effect. And it, it, as I said, I think this is all – multifactorial, but these are things that we have to look at. And these are things I, I talk to every pitcher that walks in the door about, um, you know, pitch clock and, and tack and, and so forth. And so, yes, I think to your point, I, I would agree with you. Do you think teams are going to take your research and use it against players in the sense of, oh, you know what? Dr. Meister told us this got the, this group of pitchers that throws a 20, 20 inch break sweeper is 60% more likely to blow out, we're gonna give less of a contract. Do you feel like they could use this information and this information should be presented to players and teams alike? Uh, yeah, I, I think I mean, that players and right. yeah, I mean, players and teams. I, I, yeah, no, I know what you're saying. And I, and I understand the reality of the business side of the game. Um, but my my goal is to is a, as a healthcare provider is is to provide this information to my patients so that I can maintain a certain level of health and I, and I think that's you're correct I think and I am I tell patients this now and it's amazing uh, you know I flip you know I flip the these individuals of baseball when they come in especially the younger ones especially the ones that are with parents you know these kids are throwing these sweepers and and I had a young man in the office today. Um, from out of the area, came in and, and just absolutely blew his elbow out, been throwing a sweeper with a 20-inch break, you know, 50% of the time. And, I mean, you know, 16 years old, I mean, that's just, that just shouldn't be happening. And, you know, so I, I think my responsibility as a healthcare provider is, yes, to provide this information to my patients and say, look, you know, this is, there, there are other ways to do this. And even talking to front office people and trying to have very candid conversations about this, they're going to say, well, we give, you know, our players an option. We say you can either try it this way and you might only get to double A AA or triple A and, and, and you're talking to an 18 or 19 year old. Or we can show you these two pitches and we think you'll get to the big leagues quickly. Well, you may get there quickly, but you may only last a year. And how do you how do you pose that question to an 18, 19 year old that has been sitting his entire life dreaming about going to the major leagues and, and give him that information. I think that, you know, I've got two pitchers on my pitching staff that are, that are, are clearly show you that you can get to the big leagues and not throw 98 to hundred and not have to spin the crap out of the baseball, you know, Dane Dunning and Cody Bradford, you know, they're guys that have developed, you know, a little more slowly as pitchers, but have found a place in the big leagues. You know, I say, what about Kyle Hendricks, the guys? Oh, he's a one-off. Well, Maybe it's not a one-off. Maybe it's just we're not taking the time and, and putting the effort in to teach guys the art of pitching. I mean, what's the value of a whip of 0.8 if it lasts two week, two months versus a guy maybe has a whip of 1.1 but plays 162? The teams that get to the postseason with a healthy pitching staff are going to win. That's By the, the way, I love, I, I love what you did there, bringing up Dane Dunning, you know, us Gators. <laughs> Yeah, we man. stick together, right? We stick together. Us, so I, us I see exactly. I see exactly what you did there. Now we'll let Scott ask his question. Well, I, I'm curious on two fronts. One, what you think about the pitch clock and if that's leading to a problem. You know, some think it is the problem. I think most agree that it's just part of the problem. And then two, what is the actual fix? Because you mentioned how it needs to start at the top, but we keep talking about everything. I think it keeps getting worse. I mean, it's valuing velo and spin, and then you bring guys over and you teach them even more velo and spin. So do we have to create some special rules? Like we have pitch clock to improve pace of play, but on the other side, do we have to create some rules in the game that actually stop this? I don't know what they are, like limiting velo. Like you can't – I don't know what to do here. Do you? I, look, I think, you know, as a physician, I always say your patient at some point has to take – uh, some ownership and some responsibility for their health and their well-being. If 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 you come into my office and you smoke and I say, look, you want to continue to smoke, you have an X percentage chance of of getting cancer and maybe dying. Well, I, I think that obviously this is, you know, this is a, a much less meaningful issue from a healthcare standpoint. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not 
I, I certainly don't want to compare a, a tragedy like that. But but I think that but the message is, is that patients, individuals, players need to have some type of responsibility and accountability for their own health and and well-being and say that, look, here's the information. Um, you need to be careful with maybe some of the things that you're being told and taught and and that there is another side to this and that there maybe is another way to achieve your goals and, and maybe perhaps provide you with more longevity uh, over the course of your career um, and, and better health. So I, I think, you know, again, some of this you have to throw back on the individual, on the players themselves. And I get that's a very, very difficult thing for them to do, especially the younger players. Um, I, but I think that, that baseball, I mean, just like concussions in, in the NFL, I mean, you know, I think that you have to, to somehow, some way, face the fact that there is a problem here. Let's figure out what it is. Let's figure out the, the factors involved. You know, with respect to the pitch clock, I ask all, all the players that come in the same question as well. Has the pitch clock been had an effect on you? And it's interesting that the younger players will tell you no, that they have not found this to be an issue at all. Um, I, and whether that's because this is now the way they're, they're brought up and trained or it's because they're younger and their, their bounce back ability in the midst of a game of uh, pitch to pitch is better, their resiliency, um, that's hard to say. But the older pitchers will tell you that, you know, there are times they just want to step off the mound, you know, nine, ten pitch at bat, you know, guys just grinding out foul balls. And, you know, sometimes they just need to take a blow. And, and the, you know, the hitter's allowed to take a break in an at bat, but why isn't the pitcher? So I think there, there has to be some kind of happy medium here. There has to be some discussion to, to, to at least take a, a deeper look and, 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 and perhaps walk back some of the things that, that we've been doing, whether it's tack. Uh, I do think that's a big thing. I think it'd be safer for hitters too if, if pitchers have a little bit of tack on them. Your better hitters will tell you that. They at least know that the pitcher knows where the ball's going. Um, so I, I think there, there can be some kind of compromises here that, that would benefit the game and benefit from, from my standpoint, most importantly, health. Yeah. Kratz disagrees with you. He thinks, cause he wasn't a good hitter. So he disagrees with all of you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I have to ask you a question and I, I'm sorry, this is going to be kind of, this is more of a personal question. Uh, yeah. the guy I used to work out with Chuck Wolf. I know he contacted you and I'm sorry. I gave you, I gave out yeah. your number without asking, but he, his big thing is he talks about hips and hip hip rotation and especially right-handed pitcher their front hip their left hip right and he's done a study on this for 10 plus years and he says like left hips are tight therefore they can't get it out front and they recoil and that puts more stress i mean so we're we've so we've talked about hips we've talked about mm -hmm. spin we've talked about pitch shape we've talked about mm -hmm. tackiness we've talked about pitch clocks so there is no solution i mean to me it comes across as like there's too many things and we need to start with one and work our way from one to two to three to four. But I just want to see this go away because every day it's like, you know, yesterday was Fromberg, today is Nick Pavetta, right? The day before was Strider and you're like uh, mm -hmm. Shane Beaver. You're just like, gosh, and they're all coming to see you. That's why you can drive a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think that, no, I, I think it's never going to go away completely. But but I do think there are things, there are ways we can mitigate this. And and some of this is from the coaching side. You know, it's an awareness that, that and, and incentivizing coaches in some way that, hey, take a little longer to develop this guy, but develop him so that he lasts and that we have him for, for an enduring period of time so that we can maximize his value to the team, so to speak, and maximize his value to the game. I mean, how good is it for baseball and the fans when, you know, they're, they, these ace pitchers are, are constantly going down and churning over? It, there's um, Somebody showed me a chart. If you look at, like, the top 25 hardest throwers in the game from, like, 2017, and last year you looked at that same chart, how many individuals you think were still on that same chart? Top 25, you know, hardest throwers in the game. There were two, two. And, and, and you, when you look at that kind of turnover in rosters and players, I don't think it's good for baseball as a fan, as a fan of baseball growing up and, and loving the game and loving certain players. Well, Doc, we appreciate the time. We are totally on the same page and learning a ton from you. And I think every pitcher, major leaguer or 10-year-old needs to listen to this conversation and think about, 
arm care. So thank you for joining us. It's super important. Appreciate it, guys. And we, we appreciate you being outspoken about it too because the game needs to hear it. So thank you. I know you're a busy man, and uh, hopefully we'll catch good. you down the line. For sure, guys. Good luck. Hey, make, next time I'm in Dallas, you're, you owe me dinner, lunch, breakfast, something. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. Great seeing you. Thank you, Doc. All right, guys. Take care. You too. He said See you're ya. on. He said Bye-bye. you're on. Hey, mm-hmm. we'll be in Texas for All Star. For the All Star, right? He, listen, he was one of the best. When I was there uh, in 2013, he was the team doctor, and we became tight because he worked at University of Florida. He was like the head orthoped, orthopod guy. Oh, I didn't know. If some fans were asking. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah no, he didn't go to school the there, but connection. he was like the head Got doctor. It. I don't know what you call it, but he was like the head of the orthopod. So we had an instant connection, and we would talk. And Luckily, I never had to go see him for anything, but he was he was great. and He, was, he always seemed ahead of the game with stuff like this, and now you see him. He's like the go-to guy for information and – you know, Andrews is kind of out of it now. So Ella Trash and and Meister are the two guys. Uh, I was I was going to ask you. He was your team doctor, and he just he just personifies team doctor. I don't want you to name anybody, but did you ever have a bad team doctor? Like I feel like teams do a good job of getting people who connect with the players without being like, oh, I can't believe I'm the Rangers team doctor. Like, <laughs> and, you know what I mean? Like, I think I think they do a great job, which should should be hard. But he just personifies team doctor. Most of them are happy to be there. That's a big, yeah. that's a big gig. I mean, you, you think about it. It's a lot it, of work. Of, it's a lot of work, and they got to show up at games, and they have to be there after doing their practice all Post day. Post game. Yep. But it's also, I mean, it's a big honor. Let's not forget. I mean, that's a big honor to – to, to, to be, you know, listed as the team, you know, the rain, they won the world series, the Rangers team doctor. You yeah. Know, you get the ring deal. and it elevates your career. I yeah. Mean, I remember where I grew up, like the jets team doctor, for example, was the guy there forever. And anyone that shredded up their knee and he was a knee specialist was going to him. Right. Cause think about it. Marketing in the medical world doesn't work the same. It's not like you shut up your doctor and you're like, oh, let's go over the 20 dudes. What's the power rankings? Like, check out Baseball America's power <laughs> rankings, the best knee doctors. It's like, oh, who's the Jets team doctor? Oh, cool. Okay. He's a legend. Let's go to him. You know? So that stands out too. And these guys know what they're doing. They see a ton of pitchers. Uh, but before we move on to the pitching injuries, I think something actually needs to be done within the sport. And it's going to be painful because it's going to change the game, whether it's incentivizing pitchers to go deeper into games by changing rules. Something actually has to happen to cause wins to lead to more money, or it will not change. It won't because what's the incentives? Like Luke asked in the chat, would you rather have 180 innings with a four ERA or 120 innings with a two and a half? It doesn't matter what I think or what you guys think. I know what every single team thinks, especially the good ones. Two and a half, 120. Yep. We'll, we'll figure day. it out. All day. We'll find another pitcher to fill those 60 innings. Exactly. Because they do not care. They care about winning. Winning first, everything else second. Right? Mm -hmm. And money. 100%. And and money and keeping that that value down. They're finding value in players. And there's plenty of people. If you're like, I don't want to, I don't want to blow my arm out. Then we'll just get the next guy who's willing to do it and willing to get his 80 days in the big leagues. 120 days, especially with pitchers. People hear about these injuries to superstars that are getting guaranteed contracts. It's the same amount of people. It's the same amount of guys that this is happening to in the minor leagues. Guys that never get any big league time. Guys that don't get their contract. They get their minor league contract paid for, and then they're gone because they're rehabbing all year from and same injuries as Jacob deGrom's suffering from. The difference is they're suffering in the big in the minor leagues, and he's suffering in the big leagues. Well, here, here's the thing: like we've you talked about this, Crouchy, and we've talked about this as a player. If a team comes to you and says, "Hey, we'll put you in the big leagues, but you gotta, you know, there's a chance you could shred your elbow," or guys are gonna be like, "Yeah, I'll take that chance," because then they then if they go down and they're in the big leagues, they get that hour or the year, excuse me, the year of service time, and then they, you know, so there's a lot of like. Um, players that are like yeah i can i can get hurt in the minor leagues trying to make it or i can get hurt in the big leagues get big league pay get big league service time and then a lot of these guys now they come back from this tommy jones they sign a two-year deal right the team will be like yeah we're going to rehab you for a year and then we're going to expect you to pitch the second year and they backload these deals but the player problem is shane bieber a few years ago was a 200 plus million dollar pitcher brandon woodruff 
there are many names that don't make it. It's like it's like a race. Can I get to the seventh year mm-hmm. and get to free agency before something Chris fucked Sale. up happens? Chris Sale made it. Is it Chris one Sale of the big it. things I remember when the White Sox drafted Chris Sale was they said he's going to blow out. Well, he made it to this big contract with the Red Sox, then he blew out. Right? I yes. mean, DeGrom blew out, came back, got the big money, blew out again. Strider right now took a deal that looked like a bargain, but now he might have his second TJ. So it's crazy. The pitching arm injury situation is off the charts. And let's get to injury suck because there's more over the past 24 hours. More. <laughs> yeah. Framber Valdez was supposed to pitch yesterday. He was scratched from the game. They called up a poor dude that had to come fill in. And what did he make it? One out or two outs? He's like from the Dallas area too. And he had yeah, it's just like, get crunch. over here quick. Houston bullpen picked up the pace. They had eight well, Houston won the game. Well, no, the Houston batters picked up the pace. Yeah, Ooh. that too. Jordan picked runs. up the pace. True. But the, the team was at least vocally, publicly not freaking out. So we'll see what happens. But it's elbow soreness. He's going to get examined. We'll find out more news at some point this week. How many times do guys go elbow soreness and then they come back a week later? It doesn't usually happen. No. We're hoping. I mean, Garrett Cole. We're hoping. We're hoping. I, I, we're hoping. Garrett Cole elbow soreness out for until June or July. Right? I mean, Nick Pavetta's on the list now. Fr- Fromber's on this list. It's like, you know, Shane Bieber out for the year. I didn't even know Shane, Shane Bieber went out and was dealing through seven shutty the other day. And then he's like, oh, Tommy John. Like, wait, where'd that come from? Do you remember the that? name? You remember the name Dustin McGowan? Yeah, oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah, the guy who wouldn't tip or wouldn't pay his bill. I don't know about that. But prospect. What was the story, or... wasn't the story you told about the Blue Jays guy? That wasn't McGowan? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. He didn't pay his bill. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I didn't. I'm like. No, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear what you said. I, I thought you just, I just heard you say paid the bill. And I was like, I don't know. But in, <laughs> 2004, in 2004, he was 94 to 97. Throwing, we were on the road in Reading, and after the game, I come in. I'm like, dude, I was like, awesome, great job. He threw seven innings. Come in, he's like, yeah, I think I'm going to Florida. I was like, what? I was like, we're in Double A. Why would you go down? Like, you should go up to Syracuse. Is what I'm thinking. He's like, and he looks down, and his elbow was just. It looked like a baseball was just right here in his elbow. He's like, I don't think it's good. Tommy John surgery through the whole, through the whole game, no dip in velocity, nothing after the game. He was like, yeah, I don't think this is good. So it's crazy. It, it happens differently to, to different guys. Sometimes it's a slow burn. You know, Shane Bieber had elbow inflammation last year, missed about at least what half the season. Then this off season, he went to one of the fancy spots that got him some extra velo. They, changed one of his pitch grips apparently one of his grips had changed and he got it back on track but it's non-stop yeah we can touch on pavetta for a sec too because the red sox have two injuries we'll cover at the same time here one is uh, actually a position player who had tj as well but nick pavetta who was dealing big swing and miss guys had potential for days he's working with this new pitching group you know, led by Craig Breslow and Andrew Bailey with the Red Sox. And he's on the 15-day IL now with right elbow flexor strain. Not good. No. Oh, flexor strain is what you don't want to hear, too. Because mm-hmm. that flexor strain is the one that leads to the next thing, which is the problem, uh, which is the one we just keep discussing, which is the TJ. It, it's, but, again, for me, it starts at the younger ages, and we got to figure out a way to start at the lower ages and make it better. And however you can do that, I don't know how you can do that, but it's 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 a problem. Sorry, I'm watching Brianna throw out the first pitch. So if I'm distracted, I apologize. Oh, for Wake. Yeah. For Wake, yeah. But I will go against what you just said My- because Doc said it has to start up here, right? Think about it. If I mean, I, I know your son's not pitching, but if he was pitching, right, is he going to change anything if nothing changes at the top and he knows the pathway to make it? He's not going, oh, shit, what if I get TJ when I'm – 26 and then again when i'm 30 and it screws me over he's like nah i'm i'm getting to the bigs and then we'll worry about everything else from there and there's a pathway and this is what everyone else does and i'm going to gain velo i'm going to be checking out every freaking pitch and it's spin rate i'm going to add a sweeper and dr meister's like yeah do that and we will see you for tommy john surgery and i'll be able to tell you what your arsenal was without you telling me how about this how about this if it's not going to change in the big leagues because there's big money there 
how about if we encourage our kids to that throw? I mean, AJ, what's the hardest thrower on, on your team? We got kids that can touch 90. Okay, so, so, so they touch 90. What if we encourage those kids to throw 82 to 86? And then when you need it, you teach them. You uh, teach try. them to throw 90. Just wait. You teach them to throw 90. Doesn't and matter. The scouts, and the scouts say, he's got it in there. I know he's, he's got it in there. And then we they spend more it. time long tossing. We spend more time on things that build your arm strength that your velocity will be in there. Like pitch at this. Pitch at this speed. Yeah, but this and is then, where – Pow! Okay, you do that. They, they won't because – Trust me, we have kids that do that, and they're all they're chasing is velocity. And I'm like, hey, if you threw 85 instead of 88, you'd be much more effective. And they're like, yeah, but colleges want to see 88 to 90. Yeah. Otherwise, Every they can't pitch. get recruited. Yeah, Every they pitch. want to see it because, it, like, anyone can touch it, and then they're like, oh, it was a fluke reading. Like, I need to see it for an inning at least. I need to see it for 10 pitches because then I know they can. They have it. One pitch doesn't do you any good, it, and but, they want to see that you can maintain it. It's it's just the way it works. Because if you look in the big leagues, everyone is chasing velocity. Everyone is chasing velocity and more break and more spin and all of that stuff. Yeah, and if you have it, do the extreme opposite of what you just said that AJ's team should do, and that situation will be much more successful. Th their arms might all break off when they're 26, but they'll be like, oh, cool. This, this dude's got a team full of guys that are in high school that are throwing 94 miles an hour and they've got, you know, sliders at 87 already. You know, like that's that's what they're looking for. That's not going to change very quickly. And actually, there are many teams that don't even send scouts out. They just get video now, right? And they match up the velo and the shape. So they're not even going to meet with someone but, and do that. But, they're just going to look at the video and be like, yeah, we want that because we can add a few ticks to that, and that's going to play in the big leagues. True. I don't care if he dies in three years, his arm. <laughs> All right, so funny story and on the chat. A guy, there's a guy, John Parkinson, whose kid plays on our JV at my kid's school. Yeah. And he's like, 82 is JV in Florida. He's like, what kind of, what are you talking about, Kratzy? They're going to get lit. <laughs> like, 82 here is like, I mean, you know, that's really, in Florida, that's like literally as sad as this is. It's like. That's, you might not even pitch for the team. No, let alone you're throwing 82 scouts. unless you can like, whoo, or really horizontally break a slider. You're probably not getting on the field. I mean, you got to be 85 to 88 at least. And this is why we're screwed. The th 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 we're screwed. I'm That's telling what I'm you, there's no fix. We're, we're talking about this. We're getting info. I think Dr. Meister telling us about how the pitch shape does matter and the um, the delivery, the pronation, all of that, the, the sweeper talk that he was getting some pushback from with certain analytics people that were like, eh, it's not the sweeper. Like he's saying that is part of the problem. It's there's no fix. Nobody has a good solution right now. I haven't heard one good solution. Um, and then lastly, Trevor's story looks like just another devastating injury. Mm. Here's Gabrielle Starr, friend of the show. Story season is over. Surgery Friday to repair a fracture. Recovery time is about six months. Mm. What did he fracture? Like the top of his shoulder? Not his shoulder. Was... Not his collarbone. Yeah, it was shoulder. It looked, looked like it was like the top. What's that bone like right on the point where you like. The AC. His AC joint AC there. AC joint. I don't know, but that sucks. That's mostly been a guy that hasn't played during the length of that contract. Yeah. He was a star with he the had Rockies. had Tommy John, didn't he? Had Tommy Good John real. when he joined the – He had elbow issues his last mm -hmm. season, his free agent season with the Rockies. And the Red Sox took the chance, and he has not been able to stay on the field. It's not his fault. He's, he's had – these are big injuries. This really? isn't like we're debating about a bone bruise. This is – Big ass surgery, surgery on his shoulder. So sucks for the Sox. They were relying on him to be their shortstop. They're suffering injuries early on here. So we're going to take a quick break, 30 seconds, and we'll come back and hit the positive side of what the Red Sox did over the past 24 hours and could be like somewhat of a replacement for Trevor's story. Big extension signing. So be right back. Unified Healing is sponsoring this episode of Foul Territory. Unified Healing is an innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement System, or EE System. This technology promotes wellness and deep relaxation, and there are hundreds of locations across the globe. Interested in experiencing the EE System technology for yourself? Go to unifiedhealing.com slash foul to learn more and find a center near you. That's U-N-I-F-Y-D healing.com slash F-O-U-L. 
No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, including EE system. All right, back at it. Let's hit hot corner and... I needed to cool off for a sec. Sedan Rafaela, eight years, 50 million on an extension. Remember, they just locked up Brian Bayo too. So <laughs> Rafaela is an elite defender. Rare too that you can have a guy that plays short second and right now crushing it in center field defensively. Looks like a good move. And also a little bit of Mookie Betts PTSD. <laughs> They're like, yo, let's, let's start throwing dollars at these dudes really early. Because it is not worth it later on where we either have to pay or we are burned for a decade for letting an icon go. This is a clear move that they don't want the Mookie bet. I, I think they just don't want to pay. They don't want to pay. So they're like, eh, we'll just, we'll figure out if we give out, you know, four to five. Marcelo Meyer, he's, he's down in the bushes right now. Why don't we call him, see if he wants an extension before we call him up? Like, they're like, ah, this is how we're going to keep our people longer than longer than the six years that were allotted by the league. Who knows if this guy's going to do what he can do, or he's going to be a he's going to be worth the money that they give him. But great for him. Good job. Where do I sign? Great move. Yeah, it's great for the player. It's great for the team. Mm -hmm. You know, fifty City. million is not going to break. 50 million is not going to break the bank if he doesn't pan out, you know? And so this is perfect. He gets his 50 million. The team gets a player locked up for a bunch of years. And if he pans out great and they can say, oh, look at the great contract. And if it doesn't, Raffaella can be like, I got 50 in the bank. Yeah. And it's six mil a year. If you, you know, extract it out, it's a little over six a year. So um, any thoughts, questions about that? We can answer it at the end of the show. Let's get to the Braves. Interesting now with the Strider injury and we call the hotline for some help here. The, the bat phone, Kelly Krull, our friend joining us knows all things Braves. Kelly, great to see you. Um, and you know, you have the pulse of Atlanta as well as anybody does. So we want to get right into it. I know we called last minute cause AJ and Kratz were requesting some, some help. And I was like, I, I think Kelly would help us here. So how do you think the Braves fans are feeling right now? with the potential that Spencer Strider will be gone for a year. Yeah, Scott, I really hope I'm not your one phone call when you're on that like million dollar show or whatever at the end, because I won't be able to what help you with the whole side of baseball. Plus, I'm going to be on. Um, yeah. Plus she's I mean, a Cubs fan. She's a Cubs fan. So you can't really trust her so much. You can't really trust her. Wow. Off early today, AJ. All right. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, to get into that, I, I mean, it's, Yes, yeah, you can imagine exactly what you would think any fan base is going through when the ace of their rotation comes out with an injury that while right now hasn't been solidified as this is what's going to happen, he's getting a second look. And I think last night because of the um, celebration with Hank Aaron's historic 715th home run, the 50th anniversary last night, you weren't going to get that news from the team. I expect to hear something either later today or this week, certainly with Spencer Strider, but it's a huge blow. I mean, this is a guy who came into the season with a uh, Cy Young favorite, right? Uh, at least many of them talking about that when the, the season began, but you look at the rest of the rotation now, just in talking to your, your guys' producer, Mark, this morning, I think the big picture here for Braves beyond Spencer Strider is you got to look at what Alex Anthopoulos is thinking now for the future of this rotation. Naturally, this is Max Freed's last year in his contract. And then you've got a 35-year-old pitcher in Chris Sale and a 40-year-old pitcher in Charlie Morton. And if Max indeed moves on and Spencer Strider is done for this season and arguably a big part of next season, how are you piecing together or who are you going out and getting? Who are you spending money on? Are, are the conversations changing entirely, even with Max Fried at this point? How much more does he need to show you before you possibly shell out a 
what he's looking for. And I, that is where it gets fascinating to me, I think. But to answer your, your question, Scott, I mean, as a fan base, I devastated. I mean, and I think Braves fans and beyond, right, for baseball, for us. Spencer Strider is must, must watch TV every time he steps out there on the mound. And he's one of the most exciting, if not – the most exciting, in my opinion, pitchers to watch on a nightly basis and to think that, you know, he could be going through his second Tommy John surgery here um, this season. It's it's just sad for us as fans, I think. So what do you think is the solution then for Atlanta, Kelly? I mean, do mm -hmm. they need to be looking at the trade deadline when we get there for know some insurance here because I said this on the show yesterday and it is a pessimistic view the chances of a healthy prime form more in freed and sale come October is pretty low just based on age injury history etc you're exactly right and I am not a glass half empty kind of person I'm the exact opposite but I do think knowing the way Alex runs this team uh, knowing the offense this team has, I mean, gosh, I just that that's been impressive to watch here through the first week or so of the season as a, a group that even without Ronald Acuna doing what we expect to see him do, they're averaging nearly seven runs a game right now, right? So um, that aside, though, you've got that in place, so you've got to give them the pitching to go deep into the playoffs and and end up with their goal of winning another championship. You got to give them the chance to do that. And like you said, I think Alex is really good at having a plan B, a plan C, and even a plan D. And he's been remarkable at what he's uh, managed to deal at the deadline and beyond. Um, so yes, absolutely. I think you'll see them. If this goes the way I think a lot of us are feeling like it will at this point for Spencer Strider and with a couple aging pitchers that naturally health will play into this as, as we've all seen. And um, I think that they'll go out and try to do something and, or yeah, get really creative with the guys that they have. I, that's all I said. They do have some depth. I, I really hope, you know, I think we'll see Bryce Elder. I, I'd love to see AJ Smith Shaver up and, and what he can do. But to your point, I, I think knowing the way Alex operates, that they will be looking to do something by the deadline, certainly to bolster that rotation if they need to. Because we're talking about a team that has one goal, World Series or bust, is it possible that if what's happened the last two seasons – now, remember, they also won a World Series before these last two seasons. So, like, so. <laughs> is, there, is there a chance that anybody's on the hot seat? Because, I mean, are we totally, like, are we totally just, like, the Braves are going to be the Braves for the next seven years. Nobody's going to change. They're going to make the playoffs. And, hey, you know what? If they don't win, it's okay. The playoffs are tough. Woo, Eric, my goodness. I want to flip that around and ask you, should someone be on the hot seat? No, I don't think so. But how can either. because we're so we're so we're so not used to it in baseball. Hitting coaches get fired every year and a half. Pitching coaches, some teams don't even have one. Others have like seven. Managers are like four years. The Braves are looking like they're going to be a team that is going to be elite for the next seven to eight years and that's just so unusual that is that getting boring in atlanta for fans in atlanta where that ask for so much yeah i hope not if so you've really gotten spoiled with that but you're right i mean it's inevitable right that more than likely regardless of what an incredible group this is that will be intact for the next seven eight years they're still going to fall short of that World Series or bust, right? They're likely to fall short of winning it all. And if so, what are the ramifications? It does somebody's head roll? And it, is it really, I don't know, does that change anything? But it is the way the world of sports works. And I, it's hard to imagine. I mean, they obviously switched up first and third base coaches. They've got two new coaches in those positions. I don't know how you look at a hitting coach, how you look at a pitching coach in Rick Kranitz and, and say, okay, well, 
we gotta we gotta change something or <laughs> it, it, i just that's such a hard question to answer because i don't think it changes anything necessarily to go bring in a, a coach in any of those positions that you think is gonna create a different outcome just because guys didn't perform all the way to the best of their abilities when it mattered most i but then again i'm not running these teams right i'm just hanging around them so i can talk with you guys <laughs> Perfect. We appreciate it. What, what has Chris Sale brought? Chris Sale, former teammate of mine, I know, you know, the other team that you root for in Chicago, but what has he brought to the team? Because his first two starts have been pretty darn good. Would he kill me right now, AJ, if I said all the jerseys are still in pristine shape? <laughs> no, he would actually like that quote. So, yes, he would appreciate that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love – I've always – I'm, I'm – I'm, I wish I could be around the team a little bit more right now so that I could talk to Chris again because the last time I saw him was naturally in Chicago. And, and he's gone through a lot, as you just mentioned, since you guys were together. I think – for me, the most exciting part is he appears to be very healthy. And, and we're seeing at 35 what he's still capable of doing. What I love about what Chris brings to this clubhouse is the edge. Um, it, the competitor who's not afraid to speak out, outspoken, tell you how it is. And I think there was a part of me last year when the Braves went through what they went through with the Phillies series there in the postseason. And I felt like some of the guys who would probably own up to saying something or doing something were trying to take the high road in that instance and, and, and something that I feel like to this day got completely overblown. But Chris Sale is a guy who comes in and is not afraid to tell you how it is. And if he says something, he's not afraid to back it up, no matter if people like what he said, don't like what he said. I just love that competitiveness and that edginess with this clubhouse. And of course, the guy who, as you know, AJ, right, puts in the work, you see the work every day, the results are on the field. And um, I just, I think he's a perfect fit for this clubhouse. And I'm really excited for him if he's healthy. I, I could tell with the ovation the other day, leaving the field he even spoke about it at this point in his career what even a moment like that means for him I, I just um yeah it's it's been cool to see him in this sort of second chapter of his career and I'm excited for what it means for this Braves team and for the fans is there well there is fear because it's happened the last few years going into the playoffs but yeah. is there a plan in place to not have as much as they can to not have Morton, Freed, and Sale hurt. Sale threw 100 innings last year or 120 innings, 102 innings last year. So yeah. is there like a, Chris, hey, you know what? We're going to make sure you throw about 140 before the playoffs here. Or is it, ah, we're just going to reevaluate each day and see how he feels. I think that's tough, right, Eric? I mean, Rick Kranitz is as good as they get when it comes to um, talking to his pitchers on a daily basis, like you mentioned, asking them how they're feeling, working with them as far as what a full season innings, where you want to be, how many stressful innings are we also charting and want to be aware of. And with a guy like Chris at his point in his career, but what's really tough is – because of the last couple seasons, seasons, excuse me, health wise, I don't really know if he would know how to evaluate where he is right now. And same with Charlie Morton to a degree. Charlie and I sat down, by the way, another one that I just love on like a Sunday getaway game. If he's not pitching, sitting in the dugout with and just talking about life and the game and everything else. I, I'm sure you guys have talked ad nauseum at this point about like the pitching injuries that we're seeing this season. Charlie certainly had some interesting thoughts on that last year. And I, I think the pitch clock he feels like absolutely plays into some of this. Um, I don't want to go on record and speak for him, but I, I know that for somebody who's done it as long as he has, he's, he's certainly, um, it feels like the game could be changing in a direction that does make it challenging on the pitchers and the workload that they take on. But for both of those two and a Max Freed to be healthy when they need them healthy at the most, the Braves, it, that's your guess is as good as mine. Are they on top of it? Absolutely. Is there any perfect formula? You guys tell me. Is there? Because you would know better than I would. 
<laughs> I've not heard if there is one at this point. Nope. I don't think so. No one's figured it out yet, that's for sure. I my my thing that I've been thinking about and I've mentioned on the show earlier is some type of rule change that's gonna piss people off because I don't think there's anything else. I was chatting with one fan in our YouTube chat earlier about maybe a rule that um, like kind of punishes teams for for surgeries and adds service time for players. I'm like, I mean, it's, it's, it's too crazy and teams would never go for that. You also have to keep in mind, anything on that front is going to get blocked. If it doesn't, if it doesn't help the team and it helps a player, they're not going to go for that in a CBA. So I think it actually has to be a rule on the field in the game. I know what the hook rule that's been talked about, which punishes you, you know, later in a game for losing your, um, your DH some people have thrown out like velocity limits and stuff. Like, I don't know though. I mean, that's, those are super radical rules that won't happen. So otherwise Kelly, I have no idea, but the one thing I'm pretty sure about is nothing's going to change. We're going to talk about it. It's going to go away. Like most things in the news cycle. And then we'll talk about it again in two months and next year and on. Cause I don't think the league has any plans on how to fix it. Yeah. I agree. Well, and this, this isn't the only sport dealing with it. I think about, right, like the pitch clock is something that from a fan's standpoint has been tremendous. Heck, from a reporter's standpoint has been terrific as far as how the games move quicker now and everything else. But is it protecting the players? Is it? Can we draw a direct line right now as to that being the reason these pitching injuries are cropping up? No, we can't. And I, I look at football and all that they've done to try and protect the players in certain ways and now, fans now wonder why this can't just be a direct, we've seen this, why is it not Why is it not a catch or why is this not happening? And I, I just feel like every sport is dealing with this to a degree. And as you just mentioned, I mean, it'll evolve very slowly. <laughs> yeah, and let's finish with this to tie it into the Braves, Kelly, is Alex Anthopoulos, yeah. you know, being a part of the, or running the Jays and then being a part of the Dodgers. And I remember him saying with the Braves, he learned that most of the rules that they have in place are fake rules and they don't do that much with like the really strict innings restrictions. I don't know if you've heard him talk about this, but Yuri Perez comes to mind. He looked like an ace pitching for the Marlins for a minute last year. They sent him down for a while, brought him back up. He wasn't as good as if that's how things should go. And now he's getting... Tommy John surgery. So have you heard Alex talk about this? Cause I think his tone has changed a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. And it'd be interesting to talk about it with him now, right? Like now that there's been more, um, something recently that's happened and with all these changes in places. And one thing Alex is terrific about outside of being very out, um, approachable and open with us as, as part of the media, he's also very, in touch with his players, which I know isn't always the case, depending on organizations. And if I, I mean, like he'll sit down and he'll talk to these guys about this. He'll sit down and talk to Spencer. I'm sure he's spoken to guys like Charlie Morton about it. And, and um, I would be curious, Scott, to your point, has his, I don't know, feelings about this changed a little bit as we're seeing things, um, progress within the game now that there have been some rule changes so it, it'll be very fascinating and I, i'll leave it at this too because i know you guys wanted to ask me about max um a little bit but freed i think what we've seen the first two outings from him i really liked seeing what he did he went straight through uh, two three four of houston once he came back out in that last outing after having given up the six runs there early on i'm i'm not worried about max the only thing i am curious about is how much pressure a guy puts on himself when he is in this final year of, of his contract, knowing what Max is trying to do. And, and I know he wants to go out there and perform up to the ability to which he believes he's deserved to be paid. Um, and that's where it gets interesting. So uh, it, we'll see how this works for the Braves, but they're just really lucky they have an offense right now that can um, carry them until they can figure out what the best scenario is as far as their rotation goes. Yeah, it's a good call. And also, he doesn't have guys to turn to because they all signed extensions way before they hit free agency. It's true. 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 Right? It's not going to a guy like, yo, how did you just deal with this? You know, on a they good don't team? Know. And blah, blah. Like, I, I don't know, man. I signed when <laughs> I, I was 22. <laughs> good luck. I signed a 10 year deal at 20. Yeah. Oh, no. I'm not a free agent until I'm a grandpa. So it's not me. But it's true. Kelly, it's true. thank you for the time, right? It's true. Uh, great to see you. We'll have you back on soon. And uh, yeah, thanks for the for the hustle here to talk through, you know, the therapy that 
Braves fans need right now. I know, I know. Always a pleasure <laughs> to be with you guys, and I'm glad we were, like I said, uh, AJ throwing punches early today. I needed this in my life. This afternoon. Yes. Good wake up call from from AJ with the caffeine. It's not punch. my fault. She worked for the Cubs for like ten years. Uh, I mean, okay. it's not my fault. There's I didn't it. do that. And, and I don't That's know her if you fault. The Cubs. I didn't game. work for them. The Cubs. I never game said a bad thing rough. about you either, ever. But you what? You ne- I never you said never a bad won? thing about you. Never, never one critical th- thing came out of my mouth about AJ. There may have been a few, but I always stood behind you. <laughs> oh, okay. There you go. She's I don't. Was I? Side. But I think I was retired by the time she got there, so it was fine. And you don't? No, actually, no. Actually, I take that back. No, because she was no, because she was there. What, Thirteen was your first year. Fourteen. Yeah, yeah. 13. Yeah, you were yeah. still playing, but I was gone. I right, was you gone. were out of. She the was Chicago the reason scene. they didn't bring me back to the White <laughs> Sox. <Sure. laughs> oh. <laughs> He's on fire, Kelly. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Kelly. <laughs> Jump before he keeps going. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs> Uh, you can follow Kelly at Kelly underscore Krull on Twitter, C-R-U-L-L. Um, let's jump right to picks. We've got a lot to cover in about 15 minutes until we get to the Baseball America hot sheet for the top prospects talk. And we have a very high-level prospect joining us on that show. But Who is here's it? your free game of the day. You want to know? Well, yeah. I'll tell you in five minutes Te- after this segment. Teaser. I'm going to keep you hanging. I, I, I need you to... Truck through Tigers Pirates, your free game of the day, streaming on the BetMGM app. Live streaming is available to all BetMGM customers who are logged in and have funded accounts. Click on these two. Both pretty good right now, especially the Pirates. Yeah, I'll take Detroit. Taking Detroit? Mm-hmm. Plus, give you one and a half runs. You taking Detroit run line for that mm-hmm. particular game? Mm-hmm. Okay. Any reasoning? or? Oh, it's five to three in the night. Got oh, it. this is a game that's running right now. <laughs> Scott, you knew that. Come on. He got you. Got oh, you. That was such a god. God, as his boy Millar would say, got him. Yeah. You, uh, Monday's you, locks. Oh. Mm. Not great. Except for Kratz. Yeah. Brag about no it. No sweat. No sweat. Oh. Easy peasy. Lemon squeezy. Dude, I thought mine was going to hit so bad when it went to extras and it was five to three and the Cardinals had. Oh, two me too. Like, Here we go. This is going to be the greatest cover of all time. And then they didn't score. Spencer Trimble's on freaking fire to start the year, by the way. Yeah, he's dealing. Dealing. When he was held, when he was with Detroit, he was pretty good until he got hurt. Let's yeah, not forget. So I mean, there's there's precedence here. Eleven innings, one run unearned, five hits, one walk, thirteen Ks. Not bad for you know a number six starter who's filling in. Money bags looking good. FT heater is on, and that's my pick. So I'll just explain it. If you go into the BetMGM app, this is created by the Foul Territory crew. It's at plus one twenty. Nah, it's boosted plus one forty five. Lay down a little, get a little more. It's Phillies win over the Cardinals, who have Zach Thompson going against Zach Wheeler. And Wheeler at six plus Ks. He's picked up five and ten for his strikeout totals in his first two starts. And the Cardinals swing and miss a lot. And Kratz broke it all down. It's in the BetMGM app if you want to check that out. So that's my lock. Can nice I change my pick since I didn't know that was the heater? You wanted the heater? Well, I never get consulted on the heater, so I figured that we uh, want you I to find be it, consulted. I find it, you are we want I find it out on the, the on the heater. I was not in the <laughs> heater discussion. Okay, you weren't last night, but I texted you for week <laughs> one and you didn't respond. There was extenuating circumstances. Okay, at that point. next week I'm texting you about it. Will you? Do you want to be involved? I probably yeah, won't maybe. respond. You maybe text if you don't respond next week, then you're <laughs> the week after. I'm not. I'm not asking again. You're we'll, excommunicated. We'll Yes. Mm, the battle continues. But anyway, Got good luck it. to everyone that, that selected the FT heater. Or you can tell AJ's pick, which is? Well, apparently it was supposed to be the heater, but now it's not. Uh, no, I took the <laughs> first five over four and a half in the Marlins-Yankees games. AJ Puck, ex Gators pitching. He has struggled as a starter. He's 0-2 with a 9. And Rodon is pitching. He's been good, but, you know, he's – to come back to earth so i think four and a half is a low number for the first five especially in yankee stadium with way especially the yankees have been swinging it marlins are one in ten also true Ugh, that's tough that skip schumacher's a free agent at the end of the year <laughs> he's their he's their best asset and he's leaving at the end of the year Him and john jay and john jay and I'm jesus sure. lazardo will probably be traded at the deadline but besides that everything is fine everything is fine Kratz, what do you got? Nothing is nothing is wrong. I'm taking the same game. I'm going money line Yankees, but minus 190 is not enough. So I'm going money line Rangers. So I'm looking for the athletics and 
the Marlins to lose. And that's coming out at plus 128. Kratz has the pick on them while they're down. Mm -hmm. Money line parlay. Yankees and Rangers to win. And if you're new to the BetMGM Sportsbook app or on iOS or Android where you can get the app or at BetMGM.com, you can use the bonus code FOUL, F-O-U-L, to sign up and deposit at least 10 bucks into your BetMGM account and get up to $1,500 back in bonus bets when you place your first wager. And if that wager loses, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. Can we get back to Hot Corner? Do we have time? Yeah, we have a few minutes. Do it. Oh, right, who's the, who's the special guest? Quick hitters. Oh, special guest, Cade Povich, Orioles prospect. Hmm. And Maury Povich, that baby don't look like me. <laughs> that baby don't look like me. You are the father. He, he, yeah. He's the ninth-ranked Orioles prospect on Baseball America. Which is list. like he's like the 90th-ranked prospect in baseball. I was going to say, he's probably like number one <laughs> in half the orgs. Uh, he's lights out in his first two starts. He was picked up in that Jorge Lopez deal with the Twins, which did not work out for the Twins. and Worked out very well for the Orioles. I was critical at the time. I didn't like that they traded Lopez and Trey Mancini, but that's why I'm not running the Orioles. Mm, true. Their AAA the team Orioles. is disgusting. Disgusting. They were saying, BA and some of their crew were saying that they might win. You know, if they played the A's 100 times, they'd probably win half the time. I think the flaw would be pitching depth, but they have way more star power. One through six on their lineup card probably makes it to the show on most teams already. Like they're big league ready. Who's who's not getting time? Colton Kowser is also a top end prospect. He's on the big league squad. He's had like twelve plate appearances or something. He can't find playing time. Mm -hmm. How are you supposed to get past Hayes and Mullins and Mountcastle and Santander? And they've got you know veterans in there with a whole squad of big leaguers ready to go. So anyway. Hot corner talk. First off, Blake Snell's debut, not good. It snelled. Three innings, three hits, three under runs, two walks, five Ks. First inning, he he looked shaky and he got past it, but then the Nats caught up to him, and that's not a world beating offense either. So he also, had, he also had no spring training. It's his first yeah, start. Rust. I mean, give him a break. Just pointing they it didn't, out. They didn't hit the ball that they didn't hit the ball that hard. They just they cashed in on they cashed in on his walks, a little bit of uh, throwing the ball around a little bit too. His five punch outs are there. That's what they're paying him for. He'll be fine. What about Blue Jays manager John Schneider? Mm-hmm. Went to the bullpen after Barrios gave up a single to tie France in the game yesterday. Stop. Sellout crowd, forty k plus, booing, and Stop. Barrios was trying to stay in the game. Stop what? Stop it. 101 pitches. The dude yeah. gave him, gave you everything. Boo it. That, that was just, that was, it was actually a good troll. Like they didn't get to boo him in Minnesota last year. So they got to now, but stop. That was, nasty. that's why they did it. Because of, that's why they did it. But, I mean, it had nothing to do with this. But did, I want to know, did he wear the Jordans we sent him or no? Oh, yeah. Oh, he loved Did we send him Jordans? Jordans? Well, we did? I, yeah, I did. You did? AJ I mean, I did. You, you didn't send him anything, but I did. Because if you didn't wear the Jordans, then boo. No. He loved the Jordans. One more. One more than slap. Okay. Got to get this in there. Lap. I'd like everyone to see the opening day koozies <laughs> in Colorado. You know, I found this on Reddit, and a lot of people were like, I don't see it. And then they, they would edit their post and be like, crap, that's not how you spell it. I don't know, I don't know what ARPL is, but it sounds like a cool month. People were spelling out other months, like in the comments, because Reddit comments, are they're good. They were saying, like, ARPL showers bring ma- mace flowers, or I don't know, some <laughs> shit like that. It, it looked funnier at 3 in the morning when I found this. But you got to spell I want a koozie that says ARPL. I want a koozie that says Arpel Fifth. I agree because it's a koozie. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. it's like you use the koozie too often. April's Arpel. Yeah, and it's purple, yep. so purple, purple, Arpel. Yeah. So Rockies nailed it. The Rockies nail everything besides their roster. Everything Life. else they're doing. Yeah. I, I I'm serious. Like it's a good time. I'm I'm okay with this. Slap hands.
Kratzatz, what do you got? This is coming straight from the mail. Just got it yesterday, sent to me by the West Chatham Middle School team down in Poole, Georgia. They're currently four and one, rocking second place in the middle school. I don't know, even know what the division is, but it's middle school baseball. When they have when they have uh, pregame meals, guess what show they watch? FT? FT FT on the tube. A plus 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 plus, and I actually felt a plus for the hat, even regardless. Mm -hmm. I love the back with the paw. This is this the paw front, is the nice. Colors, it's clean. It's so clean with the, with the piping, the the baby blue piping. Coach Coach Jordan Seavers, the only thing he did wrong, why it's not an A plus, it's because he got me a double extra large. I'm like, gee, oh, hell, Jordan. the fact that the middle school had a hat that big, you should be giving him an extra plus. It agreed. Uh, okay, ain't no middle, ain't ain't no plus, middle plus school plus. kid with a hat that big. No way. <laughs> hey, Georgia, Georgia, they they know how to play baseball. It's no Florida. They know mm. how to play baseball. I don't know Georgia. where Florida is, but Florida, we're pretty good. Uh, by <laughs> the way, right. love the colors. Love the colors. Uh, Navy Shout out to school. And, Navy and uh, sky blue. Those are my high school colors. Uh, wow. And also, it looks like Got a Panther ball. I don't know. We were the we were the Panthers at DP. So, you know, it fits. I like it. Shout out to the team. West Thank you for Adam. watching. West Thank Chatham you, West Middle Chatham. School. Appreciate you. Keep crushing it this season. You have an A-plus hat. Mm -hmm. Kratz hats will post it. What else? Uh, uh, Julio Tehran, thanks for being a Met. He got DFA'd. He got DFA'd. Thanks you guys for... spoke so swimmingly about him that the Mets About his season the show... last year. Yeah, we talked wow. about it last year. Dude, could you guys be. were overrating his season. It's, hey, it's just funny hey, how you guys. Can we get an H for Scott? It's just hater age. You're like, oh, Ellie, Cruz, Ellie De La Cruz isn't good, but Julio Tehran last year. Never said that got either. Got the Brewers. None of us, yeah, none of us have, no one has ever said in the chat or – People in the chat or Scooter Brown that Ellie De La Cruz was not good. We have never said that. <laughs> Nobody that ever said that. We got to finish on a high note. I loved this little clip from last night's game with the kid grabbing, or not grabbing, but getting the foul ball from a fan who did the right thing, passed it off. But the reaction is very baseball. That's the money. good stuff right that's there. That's money right there. That's so cool. It should be a marketing campaign right there for MLB. That should be everywhere on MLB. I agree. And he took the picture. Like it's That's just cool. I love that. And that's why getting a foul ball or home run ball or any of that stuff is super important. You know, we talked about it, what, mm -hmm. earlier this week or last week with the Otani home run ball. So uh, two more shout outs. One, Tyler O'Neill leads baseball with six homers, I all of one. them against I have one. Don't you steal my thunder. Who? No, go ahead. I have one. Don't steal my thunder. Oh, I'm not going to steal that one. Uh, six homers, all against righties. Uh, Tyler O'Neill is going to be the latest Cardinals outfielder to leave and become a superstar. And lastly, <laughs> well, oh, I know what you have. I was going to say happy birthday, Peter Gammons. Yeah, and I was going to say yeah, happy birthday, Peter Gammons. 79 years old, legend. Mm -hmm. We love you, Peter. But I was going to say happy birthday to Scott's favorite player, Luis Arise. Oh. He was – I mean, I can't believe Scott didn't open the show with that as much – you know, as much as he loves Ellie De La Cruz, I think Luis Arise is above Ellie for Scott. So, you know, that trade happened, and I still think the Twins won because they got Pablo Lopez. But, Scott, happy birthday to your favorite player. Twins, trade for Luis Arise. Reunite both of them. <laughs> <laughs> Twins need – they need contact. They need and somebody they need at this point. Dude, they swing in and April, miss still way too much. And April 9th, the second best record in baseball goes to – Pittsburgh Pirates. Steven votes Cleveland Guardians. Wow. It's, dude, they played the White Sox how many times? <laughs> Too many times. I couldn't hear Welcome you. They were static. What? They were yeah. static. Go, go, go. The White, the White Sox have been vote. shut out four out of ten games, just FYI. Woo. Four Stay out of ten games. Steven vote. Stay here. We'll redirect you to Hot Sheet from Baseball America. Kid Povich, super prospect, joining us. 